There we go. So we're on another episode of Friday Night Counter Attack, and um, it's just the four Man United fans today. I think it's the first time it's actually happened. So nice to see everyone back. Vish, Rahil, Arif, Arif today, in England. Today, kid. today is a good day. That's what I'm saying. Today is a very, very special good day, bro. Just unfortunately, tell, tell, tell unfortunately, he's going to say something it, now. It, he's going to say no, Unfortunately, yeah, no, it's, it's been it's a good day, and it's been a good day so far because we've been looking forward to playing football, but. If you end up on the opposite side, it's not going to end very well for you today, is it? Let's just, you know what? I ain't going to say. Let's not get into that. Let's not get into that. Exactly. There's uh, no need to get I mean, into that. I'll, I'll, I'll just chip in. Obviously, obviously, I'm not playing with you boys tonight, but I'm, I'm playing on Friday. But, you know, it's a, a special moment. So, whenever you score your goal, Raheel, I'm talking to you because Arif's not going to score tonight. Um, <laughs> yeah, make sure you celebrate, man, because it's, it's been a tough three, three, four months without playing football, man. No, so, it's been. Uh, I mean, we're not the only ones in this in this position. So, to all our listeners out there, whenever you're listening, man, whenever you get that opportunity to score and you score, enjoy that moment. Enjoy it. Just enjoy the whole factor of actually playing football again with your friends. And I was walking around the local park today and they have like a little five-a-side cage as well. And it was just packed and people were waiting to get on. And you just miss that feeling. And we've missed that feeling for God knows how long. You said it's three, four months and it's ridiculous. But I'm not messing about right now yet. Like the night before and this morning, I was more excited than I have been for the last 10 days. More excited, I should say. I don't I'm blame not, you. Like, I'm not even messing about, like, legit. No, it's true. It's it's, yeah. it's just one of those things. It's like waking up and the next day is Christmas and you get to see all your friends again. You're playing football. You're going to literally have enjoy the sport that we all love. And that's why we started this podcast in the first place. Friday Night Counter Attack was started because we played Friday Night Football together. And I can't wait for the next Friday Night Football I'm going to be a part of. So we've literally gone full circle here back to our origins. But I can't wait. Rahil and Arif, enjoy it tonight. We've got a quite a, a nice and relaxed episode for you today. We're on the international break as we speak at the moment. And we're just going to do an England Q&A, which we've, we're answering your questions from our social media. I think just our Instagram, actually. So because it's the four Man United fans, I actually have a really good question for the four of, four of us all to get involved with. So someone's asked, ask your United fans on the podcast, why Michael Carrick was disrespected by all the England managers. Was he actually bad or was he just, just out of place in the England team? So, Rahil, I know you're a Michael Carrick fan. Why don't you start with that? Yeah, massively. And I, I, I think it's, it just comes down to uh, someone that's just gone under the radar, I think, with England as well. I think with England over the years, they just went for the bigger names. With England, what we've seen is it's always been guaranteed starts for Lampard, Gerrard, and uh, there's a few players, obviously a couple of players that went under the radar just because they weren't big names. And I think I don't think a manager had it in them to like if they every manager and every England fan could see Lampard and Gerald just does not work together. Yeah, they'd have their moments in certain games against San Marino and Moldova, but at the big tournaments, Lampard and Gerald just don't work together. So you, you really and truly you have to drop one of them, you have to change your system. And I think that's where Carrick Carrick would have fit in well. For example, if you had Carrick playing with Gerald. I think in the middle, you would have seen a completely different England side. Yeah, I mean, Rahil, Rahil's, Rahil's bang on there. I mean, let me just say that the players that started ahead of him individually are better footballers than him. But I think the fact that... I would disagree. Are, I, 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 I don't would think, disagree well. I, I don't I think Scott Parker well. and Gareth Barry deserved a call-up over yep. prime Michael Carrick for me. 100%. Don't, 100%. Like. Say that again. Uh, Michael Carrick got um, less starts than Gareth Barry and Scott Parker. And they played okay. in major tournaments as well. But I, okay. I agree with what... Okay, um, what the, the, the players I've got in my head are is uh, the likes of, like, Scholes, Gerard, and Lampard. Ah, yeah. Um, yeah. But be, the fact that they... What Rio was saying, they couldn't they couldn't play together, but, again, I'm literally saying what Rio just said. The managers never had the balls to be like, okay, let me drop one of these and let me put Carrick in to actually form a team rather than a group of individuals. I mean... You, 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 know, you know what the most disheartening thing is and the worst thing is, is, is you didn't even see a manager give it a go. You think, all right, you know what, it's fine, that's fine. These two are not playing together. We've got someone like Michael Carrick and even probably other players. Like you look at Joe Cole, someone who got pushed out to the left. When he was doing well, he was winning title after title at Chelsea. Looked unplayable. But he brought him in out of position and played him out of position. We all knew Joe, Joe Cole was better off playing either with the striker as a two or just behind the striker. And he played him out left. And we see a lot of people, a lot of players that didn't, didn't get their chance. And you just think that, okay, if the manager still doesn't want to do it, but you know something is wrong, so why not just try and it, it confuses me so much why uh, Ericsson and Capello especially 
they, they didn't try looking at alternatives. You'd think Capella would have changed the system off the whole um, yeah. Steve McLaren era as well when they got knocked out before the European oh, Championship. McLaren, I'm not going to mention McLaren. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Considering you he was assistant manager to the greatest Manchester United team ever, our oh, buffer behind that guy did what he did at England. Ridiculous. I still you can't forgive him for that uh, whole David Bentley thing. Sorry, Vish, go ahead. I, I think Arif mentioned it perfectly. He goes, um, you know, England have, have this difficulty, and I still think they have this difficulty now. They've got a really good, you know, bunch of talented players. We've but always they don't, had that. They, 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 had they that don't know how to play team. together. Yeah. That's the problem. They don't have. They don't know how to play together. It's just talented individuals thrown in together. Here's eleven. Let's go win a game. And then you get all excited when you beat San Marino, who well, are, I, I uh, think we've half, been who, half the, last the team, honest, who, who but... half of the team are bloody doctors from a, a Monday to Friday job. You know what I mean? And this has been the you problem know, for England for the last but 10 I think the worst, the way, I agree with Vish, but you know, the worst thing for England is as well, you know, even when they, they do look like they get to a major tournament and they're playing decent football together, it's always a case of them just not being able to go that one step further. They look against, like, I'll be honest with you, I just think the England performance of the last World Cup has been massively, massively overhyped and overrated, in my opinion, anyway. 100%. Really I and agree. truly, really and truly, you put it on paper and look who they played. Every team they played, they should have beaten. Except for Belgium. They lost they lost them twice. But the reason it was over oh, sorry, Belgium, sorry. they should have beaten every single team that they faced. And obviously I still think Croatia they should have beat as well. Go the reason why the reason why it was overhyped is based on our performance in the last few tournaments. Is that we we act you could actually see we've had a massive improvement. The players actually wanted to play. I don't think it is, though. The players wanted it. They look like they wanted to play with each other, even, even off the pitch. They look, they look like mates. We've, we've, I don't think we've ever had that in previous tournaments. That's why it was overhyped. You're right. We, the, we should have beat Croatia as well. On paper. Their the biggest, the test, now is, the well, biggest test now is going to be in the Euros because, yeah, it's if, correct, me for, correct me if I'm wrong, but if they, regardless of whether they finish first or second in their group, they're going to be facing either one out of Brazil, I mean, not Brazil, France, uh, Portugal, and Germany, is it? Yeah, they're ones. going to be facing one of them. Mm. And that's in the, obviously the, the round after the group stage. So it's going to be a massive test, and it's not going to be an easy route. And I think that's when you will see that they all look good together when they're playing, and they all look like they're getting on. But I think that's when you're going to be able to separate the men from the boys and see actually who can, who is good enough and who has the character to take this England team forward when they get challenged in the big games and the big tournaments. Because let's be honest, that's when that's when all big players are judged. Like you look at Neymar now, he's one of them players. Why doesn't he get the Why doesn't he get the recognition for how he plays with Brazil? Because when it comes to the big big moments, or apart from the Olympics, but at the World Cup, when it comes to the big moment, obviously he didn't do well. Fair enough, he he missed the uh, Germany game when they lost, but the Brazil, uh, the Belgium one, sorry, in the last World Cup, it was his time to step up and he was missing. And that's what big players judge on. I think. When you look at someone like Mbappe, who's just started his career, I think that's why he gets so much recognition. And I give it to him as well. Because to be the standard performer and to win a World Cup, beating big teams as well at the age of 19 is crazy, man. And I, I think, I think that's, that's what England are missing. But you never know. Let's see what happens in the Euros. Good preparation for the World Cup. Yeah, because at the time we are recording, it's before the Poland game. And out of the three internationals we've had, they're obviously the toughest test uh, that we have at the moment. So the likes of Lewandowski, Milik, Piatek as yeah. well. We actually see how our defence can cope because obviously Albania and San Marino, like Vish said, they're not the toughest of tests for an England team that we have. We have a lot of captains in our team as well, like Grealish and Maguire and Kane and people that are leaders for their team. But if they can actually bring their mentality to the England team and be a bunch of men, really, that would be brilliant to see how far we can go and how far we can play. But yeah, that was that was what I would say on that. Next We've got question. So much exciting talent, though. It's exciting, man. I mean, it's, 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 it's exciting, man. I'm looking forward to it. That brings me to our next question, Arif. So, someone said, "What's your best England front three or four? So, Vish, start us off with your best front three or four. <laughs> I'll, I'll go with the. I'll choose two first. Um, I've got Harry Kane for obvious reasons. He's just a, you know, a natural goal scorer and uh, mm -hmm. scores goals for fun. Um, and obviously goals win you matches, don't they? <laughs> and it's a sister season. 100%, 100%. 100%. Um, then I've got Raheem Sterling uh, in mind. He's a really, you know, I think in the England shirt, uh, I think, was it 2018 or 16, where he got a lot of abuse because, you know, he's... Uh, in the Euros. Yeah, it was, it was one of them. And, you know, he's, he's just grown so much. And 
Pep has made him into a top, top, top player. Um, so that's my other one. He's a world class player. Let's not be around yeah. the bush. I'd say he's undroppable for England at the moment. Hundred percent undroppable for me. Uh, the sorry, other you, two, the other two. I'm not too sure. You know, I think I'll, I'll have to come back. I, I, I have to have a think. Um, probably Arif or Rahil. You know, if you if what are we saying? Uh, front three, front three or four, however you want to do um, it. I'm going to go with the front three. I think uh, Kane and Sterling. It's a given. Um, Kane for me is the best number nine in the world, um, and Raheem Sterling is, is, is our, I would say he's our, not even argue he's our best winger that we have. Um, for me, the difficulty that I had was between either having Grealish or Marcus Rashford. Um, the reason being is Marcus Rashford. I don't think he's had a great season, and I think in, injuries have hindered him for that. If he's not, for, if he's not, for, I, I don't think he's been as good as he as he should have been. Um, I disagree big time. If, if I mean it's okay, we'll we'll carry on talking about this after. But um, if he's not fully fit, I think Grealish gets a nod. Uh, if if he is fully fit, then I think Rashford gets a nod. Why do you disagree, Rahil? All right, so I'll go with plain and simple. I'll go with Marcus Rashford on the left, Harry Kane up front, Raheem Sterling on the right. And the reason why I disagree that Marcus Rashford hasn't been having his best season is because he's on course to break his um, best season tally at Manchester United. Now this guy. You look at him, OK, we all know he's been inconsistent. But if you remember correctly, we played Liverpool, I think it was two, three seasons ago. It was a nil nil draw, Old Trafford. And he, he stayed on the pitch being injured because I think one or two players went off injured already. You know, since then, he has not been given the treatment he needs to be given. I was at that game. He should have come off, but we had, like yeah, you said, two, three injuries in half an he, hour. He still hasn't. He, since then, he needed shoulder surgery. He still has not had the chance to have that. So for the past two seasons, this guy's been playing with consistent injuries. He's been having to be pumped with injections before he's playing. Obviously, he got called into the squad by Southgate. And I, don't get me wrong, there's, there's a lot of times in games where he should, regardless of what condition he's in, he should literally put the ball in the back of the net. Um, but he's a young player, and obviously that'll just come with age, and he's at the perfect uh, club to um, develop. But yeah, I, I, I don't think he's been having a bad season. I think him and Bruno pretty much have carried us. You take his goals, even last season, before Bruno even came in, it was Marcus Rashford that was carrying Manchester United Football Club. So um, I massively disagree with him not in, not having his uh, not having a good season because I think if this guy's not even hundred percent and he's putting in these performances and he's pretty much won some games single handedly for us this season. You look at the PSG game, you look at the Leipzig game coming off coming off the bench. Obviously, a Champions League campaign ended, but you look at this guy; he was the one who pretty much kept us in it. If you think about it, and same with the league, you look at his goals tally and he's on course to break his own uh, personal record. See, as a United fan, I'm, I'm being selfish, man. I, I don't want Rashford to go. As you said, he's been injured for like two years. And this is the reason had... why. This is what that's that's the reason I said if he's fully fit, then he can go. If not, he, he needs to stay home, man. It's, it's the exact same with Beckham in 2002. The same with Rooney in 2006 and 2004 when he got injured as well. But he was injured before. Some, some news. Some news from Sky Sports just come in. They got uh, yeah, Rashford Aguero's, will definitely go. Aguero's, Aguero's leaving at the end of the season. Ooh. Oh. Smart. Yeah, Sky Sports. That's that's crazy. Does that mean they're going to get a new striker? They're going to continue with a false nine? Man they're going to have, sta- they're gonna have a statue of him outside as well. They're gonna, yeah. Or they're going to have a fucking statue of everyone's city. <laughs> company <laughs> deserve one, but he's still not got one as, as well. But Yeah, man, I think company definitely deserves one, man. He... Of all the Man City legends, it's got to be company and Aguero. One mm-hmm. of the two, at least. So that's how mad, is. That's how mad it is. You look at oh, Manchester United, you're down the road from City. We haven't got the only statue we've got to play is the Trinity. That's Apart true, yeah. from that, you look Giggs, Scolds, Rooney, Ronaldo, Cantona, Bet, you know, bested in that one. But you look at so many players and they haven't got it. But that's what just makes me think that's the difference between the clubs. Obviously, if you look yeah. at it, all, but yeah, that's another conversation. We're very lucky, man. Yeah, but... to stay on England. Yeah, but it was just one of those things that I, I kind of agree that I, I wouldn't want to see Rashford just detriment his future by getting injured. And we saw the player Wayne Rooney was before. He got injured at 2006 and then being forced to play and being forced to travel to England as well. So he was a completely different player. He wasn't that um, buzzing, exciting player as much as we saw him. Obviously, he improved and he scored goals and assists, but it's just you kind of lose something when you're kind of forced to play with an injury. And I hope Marcus Rashford doesn't go through that as well. That being said, my front three, front four would be something like Sterling on the right, Kane in the middle. I'd go for Grealish on the left and probably Mount behind him. 
I, I'm a big fan of Jaden Sancho as the yeah, four. Mount uh, definitely you know. has to go. I think Mount definitely has to start as well. I think Mount has to start for me. I think it's yeah. good quality. I, mean, I wasn't. I wasn't that much of a Mount fan before, but his, his performances of uh, of late is just yeah. But see, obviously, how I mentioned my three was obviously Rashford, Kane, Sterling. I'd put Grealish behind them. Mm. As a number ten, see why? Yeah, and hundred percent, he's the best number ten England's got. It's just you're one picking, of those things you're that picking, I, you're I, picking Grealish over over Mount as a number ten. But I think with Mount, Mount is better, I'd say, as in tracking back and winning the ball back, and that's why potentially he could play as a middle two with Rice. But then we all know Sadkate's going to start Henderson. Henderson, that's, 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 that's why I've got no hope. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly, honestly, hands down, I've got no hope England are winning any Euros. We yeah, actually gonna... Henderson cannot get into that team. Like, he just cannot get into no, that team. No, but really, really and truly, if Henderson was to back himself up, he's got a point to start for England in the Euros, let's be honest. Has he or has he not got a point? Because let's be honest, now, Southgate picks his players on how they perform for their club. Yes or no? That's how he picks them. We've yes. seen in the, last, in, the, in the last World Cup as well. And that's why he will pick Henderson, because he will think Liverpool will hit with a hard season. This is the guy who went into centre-back. I'm not a massive fan of him, but let's be honest, Liverpool fans adore him. Why? Because he's got the job done for them. He's won a Champions League, he's won a Premier League. He really, he's pretty much carried him this season in terms of going into a makeshift, as a makeshift centre-back and still doing a decent job. And I think that's why he's going to start as well. Personally, I wouldn't start him, but I understand why Southgate wouldn't. We've got would, so would much more him. exciting players than that. Uh, hasn't he got a massive injury? Isn't he supposed to be out for a while, though? Uh, well, they're saying towards the end of the season, but they'll have to see how he plays out. Mm. If I just think it's, it, it, I mean, if he's just coming back from a major injury, why would you even <laughs> Like, why would you even take him? You know, yeah, so, Southgate, Southgate should know the fact that it doesn't always work well when you when you force someone back from injury straight away into a squad in the Euros. You barely get a game. Um, you have little time to get back into full fitness and full speed and full sharpness. But we'll see how that goes for Henderson and, and England going forward. If you can name your top three past England players. So, Araf, we'll start with you. Um, just players who have previously played for England and then Rahil, you can do it. And then I know you both have to go uh, um, sometime soon. If we're going on when they've both been at their best form, I'm going to go best form club and country. All right. So, I don't, because I'm... The reason I'm saying that is because Rooney. I want to put Rooney in there. No, you, you, have have just, you have to pick on just for just for country purposes, not for how they play for the club that defeats the purpose. <sighs> I'm, 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 I'm still, I'm still, gonna, I'm still yeah. gonna put Rooney in there. I'm still gonna put Rooney in there. I mean, look, uh, what what is the highest goal scorer? Um, Owen, and I'm okay. going with Gascoigne. Did you watch Gascoigne? No, I've never watched Gascoigne, but I, I've watched him as in highlights and things like that. No, that's the thing. Like, I think we've had this conversation previous times. The fact that when you hear other people talk about players previously, yeah. Paul Gasway is one that comes up all the time when there's a tournament for England as well. The fact yeah, that he's had that whole I mean, 1990 and 96 yeah. tournament, it's ridiculous how much I mean, he's done for them. We've all, we've all watched Gasway, even though we haven't watched him live. I'm sure you've seen the kind of things that he did with the ball and the things that people used to say about him. And when you watch him play, he, he, was, he probably was the most talented um, player for England ever based on what he used to do with the football. Mm. Uh, so that's why he's in there. Go on, Rahil. What have you got for us? Top um, three I'm going to say Rooney, Gaza, and I'll be honest with you, I don't really, I can't really think of a third. Owen, I'm, Owen in I'm, his I'm, prime. I probably, like, Owen, nah, I'd, probably you, I'd probably put Shera ahead of him. So Bobby Moore, maybe Peter Shelton. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we, can, we can talk about players like that. Like, obviously, I told him I'll just be biased and I'll pick Charlton. Ballon d'Or, Mike Lowen was like unstoppable, man. Until he got that was back. for like one year, though, wasn't it? Yeah, but like, still, like he was on Michael top Owen top was at right his now. best. Michael Owen was at his best on East Day 2010 <laughs> at Old Trafford. That was the best East Day ever. Oh my. That oh, was the best East Day ever. That was the best East Day ever. That was the best East Day ever. That was the best East Day ever. That's the only Michael Owen we know. Premier League winner with Manchester United, mate. We didn't know. The fans to be burning with that. I can't imagine how they were feeling. I remember finishing. I'm, I'm still uh, baffled how Fergie got this geezer to come to my team. I can't believe that. I don't know how that happened. What was it? He was at Newcastle before, and he left on a free for Man United. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. I was I was in that school. Makes sense, heck, man. I had an exam in year ten, and then I heard the sign. Oh, my clone's going to uh, Man United. Ha ha ha! Very funny. I go back home. I see it on TV. This is ridiculous. And like Arif yeah. just said, best E day ever when you're literally, literally just there in the sunshine. Oh, man, I was I was I was at my grandparents. I don't want to take pictures. I just want to go back in the game. And it was what. Um, 3-2, I think. And then Bellamy, I walked in when Bellamy, Bellamy did the whole thing. Bellamy scored that goal, yeah. And you're just like, oh, 
what a waste of a, of a day. And then you know, it know, just comes. You know what the muddy <laughs> thing is? <laughs> the <laughs> muddy <laughs> thing is, is that we just sold Cristiano Ronaldo, the best footballer in the world, to Real Madrid. <laughs> Ferguson's gone and he's got Michael Owen and he's doing in the number seven shit. <laughs> and we lost it. We lost the league on goal difference, I think, or one point to Chelsea. That yeah, was yeah. mad. Ferguson's just a machine. It was one point that, yeah, I think we lost it a couple of days before. I don't know how he used to do things he used to do. When you think about it now, you think the the teams that he had, the players that he had, what what he'd done, are you just, and you, and you see football now, you think, how did this guy manage to pull this off? For what he did off. The thing is, 25 uh, years. Of... I think he's the only manager in that era that could have managed England and won the World Cup. I was just going to throw that in. I was just going to throw that in. But he would never have done it being a Scotsman as well. Yeah, um, but if, if he took control of them when they had Gerard, Lampard, Scholes, Rooney, all of them at their peak, I think we would have won the World Cup. Ferdinand Campbell, Terry, centre back. Well, yeah. Ashley Cole, the best left back in world football at the time Super as well. Hell, yeah. Can't oh, yeah. forget yeah. about him. Um, but yeah, it was one of those things where Sir Alex Ferguson did. Every, did that whole thing of taking players out of international uh, fixtures and stuff during the season. Now, all the managers do it. He was ahead of his time with that with England as well. He didn't want to risk anyone getting injured in October when it comes up to like, the Champions League group stage and Christmas yeah, period. There's, there's so, so many meaningless games in international. Uh, uh, in international. That's why I think they bought the Nations League. Yeah. Because a lot of their games are freaking meaningless. There's no point of players going there. Yeah, but the funniest thing is, is that they've introduced the Nations League, but they've still got the really same games from before. Like, if you think international sense, break, just put on some entertaining games, they'll pull like bloody England versus flipping Austria. Like, nobody needs to watch that. It's true. And now, in this international break, they've got three games as well instead of two that will be like a Saturday and a Wednesday. It's just like spread across the three days, which is good. Yeah, track. good job is we're playing on the Sunday and we haven't really got any players that have gone. Yeah, it's true. Uh, Rashford pulled out as well, but mm-hmm. I think, I yeah, think, I'm glad he pulled out, man. I don't, I don't all know. We've got, all, we've got is, all we've got is Maguire there. For, for good news, for, for good news, um, Martial's uh, injured. Uh, he got injured. He got he got taken off. Well, I never like to say good. News. I never like to say good news to. Uh, well, I, yeah. I, I, I don't really want to say good news to a player getting injured, but um, yeah. I see where you're coming from, Vish. With that, is he may not play <laughs> against Brighton on Sunday as well. But uh, that's all well and good. Um, are you guys good for time, or are you? Uh, no, I'm gonna make a move now because I've yeah, been the labs before I head up to football. But yeah. Nice one for today and uh, catch Here's you all soon. Top podcast. Next one we've got um, in terms of the questions is name your favourite England Wembley memory. I'm guessing that means if we've been to a game. Um, but I know you've been to a game, Fish, so by all means, just remind everyone yeah. of your first ever game um, going to Wembley. So I want Yeah, to it, was, it, it was it uh, was England versus France. It was in 2010 mm. and it was November 23rd, I think. Mm. Yeah, you'll have to check that. But um, it was such a special journey because um, it was just as I went to my school. Uh, it was just such a random trip. They just, you know, uh, back in the day, they used to send a letter out, uh, and you used to have to take it home to your parents, show your parents that letter. Mm. And it was just like I remember coming home and showing my parents, saying, "Dad, I'm going to Wembley," and he's like, "Oh, that's good. Uh, how are you going? Like, I'm not, I'm going with school." And he goes. <laughs> He goes, oh, really? That, that, that's a bit random. And I was like, yeah, it is. And he goes, oh, how much is it? It was like £10. So everything was covered for £10, which was just such a bargain. And um, obviously, you're going with you know, your friends and getting on that coach and driving all the, uh, down to Wembley, which you know is not that far when you look at it. But you know, when you're a kid and you think, mm-hmm. oh, going like two hours away is far, you know, it's a Massive, two massive back after a football game. Yeah, exactly, well. ex- exactly, exactly. And the, you know, we got there, and it's just a, such an amazing feeling, like walking into the ground. You know, the smell of fresh food, and it was perfect. It was perfect, like because I think that was my first ever football game I had been to, I believe. Do you know what? Do you know what, Vish? Um, I went to Wembley for my first ever game as well. It was mad. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, my uncle took me and my brother and one of his friends to watch England versus Italy under 21s. And this was the first ever football game played at the new Wembley in 2007, around March time. And I'd never been, so I was so excited. And uh, the game was free free. I'd never heard a football stadium uh, crowd cheer as you do when you're in the ground. I'm like, wow, this is ridiculously loud. But obviously, like what, 12, 13 years later, I'm used to it, so I'm, I'm cool. But it's just one of those wow factors that like, you see these 
videos of parents taking their kids to games for the first time ever and you get the wow factor or oh look there's my favorite player down there training yeah it was like that with me but like i didn't know any of the players they were like obviously under 21s and stuff but i remember the italian striker pazzini he got a hat trick in that game so i thought you know what he's gonna be a good player he, he was good but he wasn't like a, a well beater of italian strikers that we all know uh going forward but that was one of my memories that i had as well another one is when the world champion spain came into town they came into town in 2012 so the world champions it was a year before um, they went to the European Championships, actually. So I got to see the greats like Xavi, Xavi Niesta, Xavi Alonso, Sergio Ramos, PK, Puyol, uh, David Villa yeah. as well. And little old England beat them 1-0 with Lampard's one of the easiest goals ever. I'll, I'll send you the link later, Vish, but he literally just touched it into an open goal. He just headed it in like that. And I was just there like, nah, we beat the world champions. And the, all the Spanish fans were like, it was a friendly. I'm like, we don't care. It's fun. We, we saw our team beat the world champions and I got to see the world champions, which was crazy for me as well. That's mad. That's crazy, man. And talking about that game, I remember um, England were losing 2-0 against France and, you know, the atmosphere was, towards the end, it was like, it was starting to die down a little bit. But then, 85th just, minute... Just remind us, Fish, what kind of players were playing in, in that game uh, against France? I just remember England great yeah, players to be honest <laughs> with you. That's fine. England's England at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I only remember Peter Crouch, man, because he's That's... the one that scored that goal and literally like the sound across that stadium is like, oh mate, I can't describe it. it it's I still it is... remember the, I still it remember the feeling right it? now. Yeah, it it's def- crazy, especially, man. Especially when you sit, even though there's got like bits of open air at the top, it's still inside the stadium it's just haunting for away fans but we love it as home fans it's it's just crazy man and i remember like everyone was going crazy cheering in and on trying to get that second goal second goal but they couldn't get it i remember like speaking to you know my friends that didn't go on that trip or you know family members as well they were just saying oh that was such a boring game that was such a boring game i was like no it wasn't (laughs) if you're in the stadium it's a different thing it's like a different atmosphere but yeah man that 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 is probably my favourite Wembley experience. Obviously, the first time you go anywhere, really, it's always, it's always up there, isn't it? It's always up there. And it's always something that you're going to remember as well. And you can always tell people like you just did as well. And it's always yeah. nice to listen to people's stadium stories as well. No matter how many times you go or um, how much you enjoy going to stadiums or not, it's still nice to hear what it means to you, which is brilliant. And, and like I said, I went to another game. I think it was England versus Ghana in 2011 when I was in school. And that, was, again, was at Wembley. It was at 1-1. But again, it was after uh, Azamoa Jan missed that penalty in the World Cup the previous summer against Uruguay and Suarez a handball and all of that. And the Ghana fans were just loving it. And I'm just there like, this is crazy. But ever since then, really, um, a lot of the easy games, shall we say, that, that the easy games have been upped in price. They've just been bumped up in price. Like, I don't really want to pay 65 quid to watch San Marino at home. I'm probably thinking about it now, being a year in lockdown of not having fans, but I'm still just there, like, I'd rather spend my money wisely as opposed to watching an England team like this. But it was all yeah. well and good. It's just, like we said, we enjoyed the experience. We we noticed it differently. I'm guessing your friends at, the, at your secondary school or your primary school um, enjoyed it just as well as you did, personally. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It was, it was amazing. You know what? I'll try find the ticket. I've got the ticket somewhere. And I'll try find it and I'll share it to you so you can yeah. see it. <laughs> yeah, I, I keep my tickets as well. Like I've got a little yeah. memorabilia box as well. So that's back at my parents' house. So I'll happily send I've got, a picture I've, of you. I've got I've got a special drawer here, man. It's got all my tickets, all football tickets, all cricket tickets, everything, man. Yeah, man. I'll I've, to, I've, I think yeah, we'll have to do an episode on that, you know. That's uh, you know, a pretty good idea. So if you I, have a ticket collect. Vish, ticket you collect come up with great ideas all the time. But by all means, <laughs> that's something that we can actually do um going forward as well. Um, yeah. But I do know you're short on time as well. So we've got yeah. one last question that we've got in for you. Okay. Heskey or Crouch? <laughs> I'm just going to say Crouch because what well, I just said, because obviously I've got fantastic memories uh, of him <laughs> scoring that goal. So mm. I'm going with Crouch. Yeah. Uh, okay. But Heskey was really good as well. For, I hate, you know, I hated good. the the impact that Emil Heskey had on the British media. The fact that, and the fans at the time. I'm glad the social media wasn't as big as it was then because he would always get criticised for not being the typical striker, but he was a player that brought everyone into play. He got the best out of Michael Owen as a strike partner. Wayne Rooney helped out. Uh, I think it was Jermaine Defoe and Andrew Johnson who were on the fringes, but they still couldn't get in above Emil Heskey because he would make the team work. And that's kind of what Peter Crouch did 
especially when you moved to Spurs as well, around the time when you went to watch Peter Crash in like 2010, 2011 yeah. as well. And that's when you got recognised as not just a hold-up striker, but you could score goals, fancy acrobatic goals and everything and doing really well. But it's just one of those things that we've changed so much in our style of play. We're not used to having a target man like we used to in a 4-4-2 formation. And even though we've got yeah. Calvert, Lewin and Kane, who were big, tall strikers at the time, that we're speaking of now, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't matter because the game has changed so much, and it's it's one of those things. Um, I agree, man. I agree. Um, so this one we've got in for another question is: He said, "Oli for England manager." <laughs> I don't know who that person is. Um, I wonder who yeah. it could be. <laughs> I mean, I mean. That person must be crazy, but um, obviously, no. Um, you know, Ollie's uh, currently Manchester United manager. And, yeah, uh, two, two years, years in the in the permanent position as well. But Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, his focus should be <laughs> on Manchester United, not on England. And to be honest, man, like, I, I get frustrated with the international break and I get frustrated with England because there's so many reasons. And mm. I, I'm just not really in that much. That interested to be honest with you, uh, watching England play. That's exactly um, like with me, unless it's a big game like Poland. Like, I know Poland aren't the even biggest, even Poland, team. man. Like Lewandowski's injured. Like, I saw that headline. I thought, you know what? I <laughs> forget it. I'm not, I'm not even gonna give it up. You know, I'll check it's... the score, but I'm not gonna watch it. No, that was like with me. Like, uh, on the weekend, we played Albania in the San Bruno game. I was rather watching a film against the Sa- on the San Bruno game, or I was mm. um recording some new content, which is a new show that's coming out. Uh, in May for Friday Night Council Jack on our YouTube, but I won't spoil that yet. But I was recording some new content on the Sunday because the guy I was yeah. recording it with was like, yeah, I don't want to watch England either. They're boring. <laughs> and then after the game, it was, what, it was like 2-0 as well. Um, yeah. But that was crazy as well. But Vish, I know you have to go now. You can leave whenever yeah. you need to. But I just, I think you'll look forward to next week's episode just like with myself because we've got um, a very special photographer on who's the official photographer for the England cricket team. And he does Premier League and Championship uh photography as well so i'll look forward to seeing you the next week monday yeah, enjoy your weekend man. and um, you man and you and, and uh, you take care keep health, the is wealth, as well. health is yeah wealth, definitely man. yeah definitely i'm gonna keep it for next week <laughs> definitely, man. but now nah, just one closing uh, message i can't wait to see you at friday night football as well i know it's, oh, yeah, che- it's cheesy that i'm doing it on a record but it's just been so long since we've seen each other properly but yeah know, it's just man, nice to see you as always but if you have any and closing you. messages i'll leave you to it and we're good to go people health is wealth don't don't forget that. <laughs> that's all I'm gonna say. I think that should right, be the cool, title man. of an episode. But now that's yeah, cool. man. Definitely. There we go. So the guys have just left, and I thought I'd invite my cousin Adil back on. Not back on. It's the first time he's actually appearing on the podcast because he's appeared on some upcoming projects for us as well. So Adil, thank you very much for coming on the conversation at such short notice as well. How you been? Um, I'm be I've been good. Uh, good. First, it's a Monday. The usual so, Monday. Going back yeah. to work. You don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> What do I have to get up for? I haven't experienced that for a while being on furlough, so I'm just happy. Just like Mondays for us, we're just so happy because we're like, there's the podcast, there's our podcast day. Oh, so <laughs> that's what I'm like every Monday. I'm just I'm just like, forget work. Just the podcast is what is what keeps me going. It's on a life of bliss being on furlough, just being <laughs> since you don't have to get up at half six in the morning. No. <laughs> Why? Why? Why do I have to do it? Why are we doing this, man? But yeah, I thought I'd invite you on for some Q&A. Uh, people on our social media have been asking us very quality questions, very good quality questions, I would say. And we've answered a couple, so I thought we could just finish off the episode with you coming in and we could just answer them together. So I thought that would be quite good. I'm glad you you came in, you came through, which is brilliant. But um, let me start you off with, with one that I think you have quite a passion for as well. So if you can tell me your favourite and your least favourite England manager for us. That would be a great start. My favourite England manager? Um, Do you have a favourite, first of all? <laughs> Who has been my favourite England manager of all time? Not all time, of what I've seen. Mm. So for me, it starts from what? Sven Goran Eriksson to Southgate. So that's my kind of era. Uh, so yeah. My I least favourite... My least favourite, I have to say, is Steve McLaren, because obviously he was just a joke of a manager for men. Yeah, for Wally, in the, Wally in the Brolly. Wally and the Brolly, oh, which Wally I'm just going to get Brolly. that. Wally with the Brolly, yeah. couldn't get through the European Championship qualifiers, let alone to the European Championships in Austrian yeah. Switzerland. I'll never forgive a, him for that. that such awful. an easy group as well. All we had was Croatia and a couple of other teams and we really should have won, but we didn't and it was awful. Yeah. And that was quite sad because we were close to 
he he wanted to disband the golden generation. He did little things like starting uh, David Bentley on the right instead of David Beckham. He was trying to yeah. bring Gareth Barry into the team before he was probably good enough to play for him at that time. And he it didn't work. Beckham. He took Beckham away, didn't he? Mm. And Beckham came on for that last game against Croatia. We still lost 3-2, but we were just so out of it by then as well, which was awful. Yeah, because but... he chose... Who was who was in goal that day? Was it Robert Green? No, it was Scott Carson. Carson, and the ball went under his legs. Yeah. Or through his legs. Went through his legs, and he just messed Bobbled up. Bobbled over the line. We're not going to talk... Like, England goalkeepers are just like <laughs> Mez, Paul Robinson, yeah, Robert Green. We've had some terrible goalkeepers England have. David Seaman. Terrible. Jordan... Jordan Pickford, for all of his mistakes in an Everton shirt, I'm not, I'm not sure I've seen many in an England shirt, so that's positive. But I'd rather start. I'd rather start Nick Pope personally. I think he's a more assured keeper to have. Even if he plays for Burnley, he's more of a assured keeper for me. Or even Dean Henderson. Would you? He's a bit. He's a bit raw still, but Henderson looks a solid goalkeeper. He does. He is, is raw to me personally. I know he's done a couple of seasons at Sheffield United and previously at Shrewsbury and wherever, but I think. Henderson would be a good backup goalkeeper, but um, Nick Pope for me should be a destroyed keeper. He's done, been there and done that in the Premier League for a number of years, and I'm quite happy to have him as mm. our number one as well. Um, but my favourite manager, I'm not going to give a favourite manager. Should I, should I say Sam Allardyce being my favourite manager? One game, one win. <laughs> Adam, Mal- Adam Milan, the last minute, last minute winner <laughs> uh, against Savinia, I think we played. Or Savakia, what about, we played? What about, no, Fabio Capello was a bit boring. I didn't like Capello. He, it was his worst managerial job I've seen him do. Compared to the great teams he's led previously, that yeah. was that was awful. And we, I were think just, he was... we were just discussing previously how he like omitted Michael Carrick from the England squad and the team. And at the time, Carrick yeah. was in his prime and stuff, um, just because he tried to fit Gerard Lampard in all together and he was playing players out of position to fit. I think that they Ericsson. Want. I'd have to go with Ericsson as the favourite one. Sven Joran Ericsson as the favourite from all of them. Mm. He did. I liked him at Euro two thousand four. I think personally for me, I would just stick with Southgate to be safe because obviously semi-final in, um, in the World Cup, obviously we had so many memories at the time of literally going out on penalties, but he disbanded yeah. that memory. He chose a team based on their performances, not on their reputation, like like Roy Hodgson picking Tom Cleverley because he played for Man United or John Joe Shelby because he played for Liverpool at the time. Yeah. Doesn't make it, doesn't make it any good that they played for the big teams. They didn't perform uh, for their country. Also, I think... I think Hoddle's England played some very good football. Mm. Was that 98, 96? Yeah, yeah 98, 98 World Cup. That team played some very good football. Mm. And if it wasn't for the red card for Beckham and going out on penalties to Argentina, I think England would have gone far in that tournament. Not that's sure always, how far, but... That's always yeah, the case were. with England as well. The fact that there's always a hindrance, like a red card or penalties. And, yeah. Like 2006, Rooney got sent off and then penalty shootout, they lost. Mm. And then what, 2008 didn't qualify, 2010, Germany 4-1, no excuses there. 2012. That was just that was just diabolical, that tournament was. We were horrible the whole way through. Why don't we talk about, and this isn't a question, but let's talk about Frank Lampard's goal. Will it have changed the course of the game if it was 2-2 before goal. half-time, the ghost goal? I don't know, I think Germany would have still just improved and just come out and battered us anyway. Mm. <laughs> they, just, they were just that type of team. Because like you score a goal against them, and then it's almost like Bayern Munich. You score one, and they just come back and bat you. Yeah, obliterate you in, in yeah. that half as well, which was crazy. But what was that team we were playing as well? We had Upson, we had John Terry, we had the Diamond. I think we were playing as well. Milner, yeah. Gerard Lampard, and Barry in the Diamond, yeah. Yeah. and um, Rooney Defoe up front. I think that was. And then yeah. everyone got really upset about Peter Crouch being left on the bench because Emil Hesse came on as a, as a striker uh, yeah. substitution as well, but. That still robs me to this day, the whole Lampard goal and not being able to see that and celebrate it like it was a goal because it was a goal and it was crazy yeah, like that as well. Forget this game, it's awful, I hate football and obviously when the Premier League comes around you just love football all over again. So <laughs> that's, that's what it is. Yeah, but yeah, it, it is crazy. Um, next question you've got, um, favourite goal? Favourite goal for England? Of course that has to be the next question after we just talk about Frank Lampard. So what's your favourite? Favourite goal for England? Yeah, man. What would you say? Would you say My the Michael Owen one because you you were around for that? You can remember that against Argentina. The one against Argentina, mm. maybe. Or I'd go for David Beckham's free kick against Greece. My favorite goal was a David Beckham goal, and that was against Ecuador. That was the um, oh the World Cup, the World Cup 2006. That was when you're just there, like we're in the knockout rounds. It was the only goal of the game. I quite enjoyed it as well. David Beckham was against in against Greece. 
I don't watch the games. So I'm not going to pretend like I know. Obviously, I see it every now and then on social media, which is great. But yeah. like for me to remember a certain goal, that David Beckham goal against Ecuador was was a lot to me at the time. I was just like, yes, this is a great goal. Um, the David Beckham, my footballing hero, as you remember, as a kid having Beckham on the back of my kit, he was mm. doing well for England, captain of the country. Mm. And it was, it was fun for yeah. me to see. I think it was that Beckham goal against Greece. We, yeah. was, we were like on the verge of not qualifying for the World Cup. We were playing so badly. And then it was like the injury injury time at Old Trafford, and we get a free kick in front of the you know in front of goal, mm. twenty five yards out. And you just kind of knew that Beckham was going to score. That must have been something special though, because I remember obviously later a couple years later, obviously he would score free kick goals when I could remember them. But it's just the yeah. fact that everyone was like David Beckham did this against Greece, and no other free kick will be better than the one he did against Greece. Yeah. I'm just there, like this mad. Because it was like, it was like pressure. It's like almost a penalty. You score, you go through. Mm. You don't score, you're out. It was the same with the free kick. You score, you go through to the World Cup. And you it's don't like score, that. That's it. Yeah, it, it was like that with Lionel Messi in the uh, World Cup final in extra time against Germany. If he scored, it would have gone to penalties, but he missed, yeah. and World Cup was lost in Brazil by Argentina, and Germany ended up winning. So. That was something yeah. that was something that Messi couldn't even do, but Beckham did, which was crazy to yeah. see as well. Uh, but yeah, David Beckham's got our favourite goals in our memories as well, which is brilliant. And again, you always try and replicate these kind of things when you go out into the garden or into the park or something, trying to do the whole arm swing, yeah. and how he takes that free kick. So it's just, it's just you'd ridiculous. Always, you'd always try and bend it like Beckham. Everyone wanted to bend it like Beckham at the time. I had a mohawk, believe it or not, that I tried to keep like Beckham, but he shaved it and I was like, mum, I need to cut my hair again, following Beckham. But... <laughs> It, 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 it was exactly like that as well. Oh. It's like we can't be doing this. This this is not this is not it. This is not it, mum. Um, but mum yeah. was like, mum was like, do you know how expensive haircuts are? You're not getting another haircut after two weeks. <laughs> just shave it, mum. Get a razor and just shave it. I should really be doing that now with my lockdown hair as well, just shaving the hair off. It's just not the one. But yeah, David Beckham for our favourite goals. Um, what have we got? Let's see what we've got next. This one's got six aside pass players. Um, we normally do this one each because there's only like five or six of us, but I think because there's two of us, we'll kind of okay. do it as like six aside past um, players that we've seen. Because like okay. obviously, I'm not going to go like Gaza, so Bobby Moore, so Bobby Charlton. Obviously, they're amazing, great players, but I didn't see them. That's how I kind of do these six asides. Yeah. So who yeah. would be our goalkeeper for the six aside? Mm. So it's an England six aside, basically that we've seen. <laughs> for England yeah oh, I mean, crap why don't we why don't we skip a goalkeeper and have like a couple of defenders in there so I, I'm going to happily say Rio Ferdinand and Ashley Cole need to be in there for me uh, for yeah. their, their quality defenders at the time yeah um, you can have like a rush goalie Rio Ferdinand maybe Ashley Cole as, as another defender so yeah I think that's a nice little combination to have Ashley Cole probably one of the best left backs I've ever seen in my life the fact he did so many games 8 out of 10 9 out of 10 10 out of 10 performances everyone just expected it from him but he was yeah. so good at keeping it consistent over the years and it was yeah. kind of it's kind of a bummer that he didn't actually go to the 2014 World Cup to kind of uh, have his last hurrah and Luke Shaw went but he barely played until the last game when he was knocked out already mm. I don't think Leighton Baines was was ever as good as Ashley Cole is, was in, oh, her, no. in his career no. even if Baines was younger and they wanted to plan for the future Ashley Cole was a much better player at the time even if he was getting um omitted from the Chelsea squad by Jose Mourinho. I think he, he was at the time. I think Felipe Luiz or Aspel was the left back for them. I don't think Leighton Baines was ever England quality. He wasn't up to the standard. An yeah. international fullback. It's just the fact you had Ashley Cole and then you had anyone else. Like Warnock was there. Baines was there. A young Luke Shaw was there. And Luke mm. Shaw was seeing now thriving uh, for Man United. So hopefully he could thrive for a number of years like Ashley Cole did and do it in the yeah. England stage as well because... When you look at the England players over the years, Ashley Cole is the one that never faltered. Yep. Yeah, he was always the solid. And we'd always have a problem, not at left back, but at right back. Yeah. After Gary Neville kind of so, went hit and miss, it went was Brown, Mika Richards, um, Glenn Johnson, Kyle Walker, but yeah. it's never been consistent ever since then. But now we've got kind an abundance of, of left backs. After Gary Neville, there was no one actually mm. for so many years. You're just there, like, think, it can be someone this week, someone this week, someone this week. And, like, Luke yeah. Young was thrown in from, I think, Middlesbrough and Aston Villa used to play for Luke Young. But 
so many inconsistent choices to have under different managers. But for our little defence, uh, Ferdinand and Ashley Cole, are you happy with that? Yeah, I'm happy with that. I don't have to say anything yeah. real Ferdinand that we don't already know anyway. The fact that he should yeah. have gone to the Euro 2004 because the Rio Ferdinand <laughs> should have gone to the Euros because of that drug thing that the, the FA yeah. just yeah. ruined him and they ruined yeah. our chances of going forward anyway. But that was perfectly fine to put them both in. Midfielders, I would say David Beckham, obviously, love the guy. He was a quality midfielder for us as well for a good number of years. And I'm a very happy p- person to put David Beckham into my into who, my six society. Who, this is a, this is the next difficult question. Who would you pick from the central midfielders oh, that you've seen? Gerard, easily. You've got Gerard, you've got Lampard, you've got Scholes, you've got, got Parker, Carrick, you've got... You've got- Ah, uh, Parker, no. I don't think yeah, it's up to that. That's what I'm saying. Like, Parker, um, Barry, we, we were saying this earlier, Parker, Barry literally went um, to more co- uh, competitions and started more games than Michael Carrick. So we were just complaining yeah. for 15 minutes that Carrick yeah. never got his, his time in the sun for England. And I think that would have been a beneficial thing. But Gerard literally did perform for us, even if we're Man United fans. He performed in, what, a 5-1 win against Germany. He performed mm. in the 2006 tournament again. Trinidad and Tobago are hardly the hardest team, but still performed mm. against them. 2010 World Cup, that opening game against USA. Quite yeah, experience. I, I love that personally as well. Um, do you think? Do you think if Michael Carrick was in that midfield alongside Gerald instead of playing Gerald and Lampard, do you think England would have been better? Yeah, definitely. We were just saying this earlier before you came on. Like all four of us just unanimously agreed that having Carrick as like the linchpin in the field, like kind of the Sergio Busquets, allow yeah. Xavi and Iniesta to be free and to be the players that yeah. they were. Michael Carrick it was in that same ilk, basically. The fact that he could be yeah. the linchpin in that England midfield, but no manager, especially Fabio Capello, had the guts to put Michael Carrick as a starter, consistent yeah. starter for England. And especially yeah. that 2010 World Cup, playing four centre midfielders, Milner, I know. Lampard. I know. Uh, Gerard and Barry Gerard and not one of Barry. them was Michael Carrick that was awful no. that was a poor decision from Fabio Capello and Michael Carrick just keeps ball possession like no man's business and he could probably do it now even though he's retired and the coach but yeah yeah. for me David Beckham and probably Steven Gerrard um, up front who have we got Rooney Owen Rooney Crouch Rooney Heskey Owen Heskey I'd go for Rooney and I'd go for I'd go for Alan Shearer and Wayne Rooney I wonder if I feel Walcott in there for some reason. I don't know why. Now, Walcott was never good for that. He was never good, but I just remember that Euro 2012 tournament when he scored against Sweden outside the box. Like Ibrahimovic was just giving it all that to Joe Hart. And then Walcott <laughs> comes on and scores, and Welbeck scores the winner. But yeah. it's, I'm probably not going to go for Fio Walcott because he still plays. But for me, I'd go Rooney and I'd go Rooney and Owen personally. But obviously, for you, you'd go Rooney and Shearer. But... Well, Michael Owen. When Michael it... Owen was still a 19 year old. It was Owen, Owen and Shearer. Owen and Shearer. And, because I remember yeah. Owen and Shearer from when they played at Newcastle. And it just wasn't ah. the No, same. this was way before. This no, that's what I'm saying. Before. It was like those two didn't work for Newcastle, but clearly they worked in a Glenn Hoddle's England side as well. Yeah. It's like uh, in 98, that's when they played together. Because mm. after 98, I think there was Kevin Keegan in charge mm. when they went to Euro 2000. Okay. England, were crap. England were rubbish at Euro 2000. No, I know no. Shiro was still playing, but they weren't very good. No, but yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd go for, I'd go Rooney and Shearer. Purely Rooney. because of Van and Shearer's link up play and, you know, holding up the ball and his finishing as well. Yeah, amazing finish. And that's something that Harry Kane will, is looking to emulate, obviously, and just keep scoring more goals, which is brilliant. But yeah, that was your team. So my team was Ferdinand, Ashley Cole, Rush goalkeeper. Um, yeah. Then Gerard Beckham, Rooney, and Owen as my past yeah. six aside England team. Yeah. And what was yours again? Mine was just taking out Owen and swapping into Jira. Simple as really. So, that's, yeah. That's perfectly fine. How did Southgate manage to get the England job? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm not in charge of hiring, but. Um, we're, we're not. We're not in charge of the FA so can't really but answer that question when you look at it at the time who was our manager Roy Hodgson he left after Euro 2016 uh, we had Sam Allardyce in for one game and yeah. Gareth Southgate was kind of building the under 21s into a better um, system at St George's Park and 
trying mm. to get everyone to integrate properly as well. So it was just a natural selection that you're going to yeah. someone who's been there and done that a number of years at the younger level. You're hiring an English yeah. coach, so he sees the Premier League week in, week out. He can level with the players. And yeah. um, one of our guys, Arif, earlier said that um, the, the players were a lot more happy and a lot more as a unit. And we saw that at the 2018 World Cup. They're less yeah. of individuals and they were more of a team in a bond and um, it was yeah. literally just something that we noticed previously. So even if people don't like Gareth Southgate as a manager or think they're better qualified players, uh, better qualified managers to do that, he's, mm. he's got us to a World Cup semi-final, he's got us in the Euros, but it's just the fact that we are playing against some of these big teams and we aren't really doing very well with Gareth Southgate as the manager. But what are your mm. thoughts on Gareth Southgate, Adam? I think Southgate, he's a bit of... He's kind of hit and miss. Mm. Because he's not a big name manager and he never was a big name manager or a big name defender as of when he was playing he was a squad player for England he was yeah. over from um, someone at Middlesbrough to kind of ma- manage them and he still didn't do that well yeah but... and I think as England manager he's, he's like Marmite you either like him or you don't like him like him or hate him yeah you know but... at the World Cup you saw that he brought the togetherness back as an England squad, you know, there was no. They were they played as a team basically, mm. and he even brought back the connection with the fans as well. That's what I like you know. the most about him as well: the fact that it wasn't something that, oh yeah, these are twenty three going to the World Cup and stuff like. That. It's little things like them interacting on social media with one another. It was them interacting with the fans through like fan questions and Q and As and stuff like that. It was them. Yeah saying that we do need your support and you appreciate the support. And there was that passionate celebration he did against um, Sweden. After they beat Sweden, yeah. He was just there, like, on his own after the players had gone. He was just celebrating passionately as a fan of England yeah. to the fans. And the fans appreciate that. And we saw that at home and we were like, we love it because it's not Capello, it's not Hodgson. It's just, like, very well done. Let's go back and yeah. change what we've done. He was like... And even a, a touch of class after the Croatia game as well. He was like to all of the players, like, don't sit down, stand up, go over to the fans and thank them because yeah. they've done this for you and you've done this for them. And the, yeah. the feeling was mutual. I wasn't, I was obviously distraught that we lost to Croatia the way that we did. But mm. the team that we had um, against what Modric, Kovacic, Rakitic in that midfield, when we had what mm. Henderson, Lingard, and Ali in that midfield as well. We were just yeah. outplayed in the second half completely and we really should have taken our chances early and we're not going to go into yeah. all of those chances, but it's just the fact that that uh, just comes with experience. You're just, they're just going to have to learn from it and they're going to have to move forward and Southgate will hopefully learn from it, move forward and play a lot more aggressive teams in the European Championships. That's just how I see it personally. But I think on the other side is tactics sometimes are a bit, I don't know, they're not very adventurous. No, not at all. It's like playing, what, three right-backs in the same team. You've got, what, a centre-back, right-back, a right-back, yeah. right-wing-back, and then he's got, like, another right-back has left him back when you're just there. Like, like the one thing that I want him to do more is play Jack Grealish. Yes. In that midfield. Where would you and play him? He, as, as a number 10 or, like, or as, as a winger, basically? Left winger. It depends who else you play alongside. Because we were just doing our front fours previously and we were just, like, for mine, mine was Sterling on the right, Kane on in the mm. middle, Grealish mm. on the left and Mount mm. behind the striker as well. So that's how I kind of saw it. But others were like, oh no, play Grealish as number 10, Rashford on the left and you still got Kane and Sterling to start as well. But how would you kind of do your front three, your front four? Would you start Grealish on the left or in the middle behind Kane? I think I'd play behind in midfield, Grealish. Mm. A bit Maybe more freedom, a bit more fluidity. Grealish, Mount, and, you know. Rice, Ward Prowse. Yeah, Rice, yeah. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I see it personally. I think Grealish can play in a number of positions. Mount can play in a number of positions. Ian Foden can think, as well. But I think yeah. Mount and Grealish are just above the um, Foden and Madison for me personally. Mm. That's how I see it. Because mm. I just think he, their quality and they can actually do on an international level. He, he needs to be more adventurous in the team he picks, not pick so many defensive midfielders as well. Mm. Like even against little teams, he'll pick Henderson and you know Rice. Or Calvin Phillips and Rice. And this is yeah. obviously recorded before the Poland game. So we'll see how that goes and we'll see if that's a suitable thing to kind of play just the one holding midfielder and two attacking midfielders so they can play free and be free as well. And hopefully everyone stays fit. So it gives Gareth Southgate a really troubling situation of picking the 23 as well. But yeah. um, 
that kind of brings us to our next question. With this current England squad, surely they will be pushing to win the Euros. I hope so. I hope so too. I don't see I mean, how we can't, um, how we can rule ourselves out of rule, uh, winning the Euros. I know every year we're in the whole, oh, we're going to do well. We're going to get overhyped <laughs> as we always do. England fans always yeah. do. But yeah. look at the quality we have, man. It's something that we really yeah. need to push for. And we should never go into the tournament thinking, oh, if we get to the quarterfinals, it's progress. It's, it's not. Mm. Just go we need to go all the way. I think even with the players we have right now, mm. it's, it's achievable. I think they probably have one of the strongest squads in Europe. I'm glad you used the term squad because it's not even just the starting 11 that we have as strong. Like on the bench, yeah. quality options and people like Jude Bellingham who's doing really well in yeah. the England squad as yeah. well to get in at a 17, yeah. 18 year old. We've got Sancho who's injured. Really, she's currently injured as well and mm. they're not even in the squad. So they can literally I, pick up as an England fan and with this England team. When, when Sancho's on form, I think Sancho's a starter. Yeah, that's that's it for me. Like I, I like Jaden Sancho as you, as you know and everyone knows already by now but it's just the fact that do you get rid of Raheem Sterling, who's kind of been there and done that at international level, and then start Sancho on the right, or do you kind of have him playing with Sterling as both the wingers and Kane up front? It's just it's just how you kind of design your your England start of eleven for me. But then what do you do with Marcus Rashford? Because exactly. I think Marcus Rashford deserves to start as well on the left. Yeah, it's just so many options available. And we've never ha- we've never had that really. We've never had like think, multiple attacking options yeah, yeah. as an England fan. Because Sancho's like a winger that isn't scared to take people on players on we've never had that as in, an, in an England squad the last but player that, uh, that reminds me of is probably Theo Walcott but that was before he got into the England squad as well but he would just mm. use his pace to take on people Sancho's a lot yeah, better he, technically he, as well yeah he didn't have the skill as Sancho does Sancho mm. has a skill and he's a very good crosser as well I do like Jaden Sancho he's very good at assisting yep. players, especially Erling Haaland yeah Bruce Dortmund, but again, Sancho's injured at the moment. But yeah, I think that's, that's those are all of our questions. So um, I just want to say thank you very much for coming in for the second half of the podcast, Adam. So um, we've had, um, I've already mentioned already, but we've got one more episode next week and it's our last little interview before we go on our little break for Ramadan. So we'll be away for four to six weeks. And Adil here is actually part of a couple of conversations that we've had. So again, they're pre-recorded shows that we've had, but they're still going to be conversations and debates that we've had which is another little thing we've pre-prepared for our listeners so um i'll give you a little teaser it's just about little footballing hero moments so we talk about our footballing heroes how they made us feel as kids and what we look at them like now like reminiscing on their past so that's something that uh adam's got a couple of episodes and quite a, a big hand in coming forward so um yeah you'll you'll be hearing adam a lot in the next couple of weeks and you'll be seeing that a lot in the next couple of weeks but yeah I thought it was a nice introduction yeah. thank you very much everyone for listening I don't thank you for coming on again for the second half we'll see you all no soon problem. take care and enjoy yeah. football again this week because we're back to sports but yeah thanks everyone very much take care and goodbye <laughs>